welcome everyone uh, to this uh, very special uh, version of the energy systems uh, seminar uh, arranged by Entenu uh, Industrial Economy and Electric uh, Energy. Uh, we are very happy to have a special guest here uh, today, uh, Dr. Elvin Botteru from uh, MIT and Argonne National Laboratory in the US. So Elvin Botteru has uh, a PhD from uh, MTNU uh, from some couple of years ago. <laughs> and also, yeah, civil engineer, yeah, just like me. We were former colleagues here during the PhD. Uh, I'm one whose purpose, by the way, professor at TENU, uh, Electric Energy. And we also have, uh, um, we're affiliated with, uh, at the uh, CIMDEF Energy Research, working with uh, hydropower planning tools uh, back in those days. But uh, the last uh, 20 years, uh, the Bottery uh, has uh, grown to be one of the main, I would say, experts in renewable integration and uh, decarbonization uh, of power systems in the US and has been participated and led many important uh, international uh, projects. So your words, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in that field. So uh, today, uh, we will uh, give a little overview of his research and uh, what's uh, going on uh, on the US side in regards to decarbonization and power market development. So the floor is yours Thank and you. uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Magnus, for the very kind introduction <clears throat> and you forgot to mention, I think, that we were students, PhD students at the same time, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so it's very nice to be back. Uh, as you said, 20 years, I had to start calculating. Um, and it's actually true. It's, it's, I, did, I did my PhD defense uh, almost exactly 20 years ago. Then tell you, the time flies. Um, yeah, so what I'll, what I'll do is uh, tell you a little bit about a few different research topics we are working on. I have two affiliations, two main ones in the US, uh, and I also currently I'm in the UK for a year at the University of Cambridge, which is really exciting to place as well. Uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about, this is the group, I, uh, small research group I'm in charge of at MIT. Um, and what we do is to look at uh, the energy transition challenge. Uh, and we're working on developing tools, methods to analyze um, questions around how do we integrate large-scale amounts of renewables in the grid? How do we design markets for uh, future low or even zero carbon electricity systems? Uh, and my, my, we are based primarily in Leeds, Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems, uh, which kind of, you could say, provides a good toolbox because most of the people in Leeds are deep into methods. Uh, we were working in the energy domain, which is very interdisciplinary. So I like to say that you need a big toolbox, but you can see kind of the main components you typically use in this square or a rectangle here. Um, applied to you know uh, a range of different topics in the energy domain, primarily uh, electricity uh, related. I'm also working closely with the MIT Energy Initiative, and to some extent, they provide applications. There's about the research projects coming in through the Energy uh, Initiative. Uh, of course, there are people involved. The list of current kind of more or less members here. Uh, the pictures I just wanted to point out, if you compare 2019 and 2022, you can see that they are making some progress in terms of diversity. Um, the two youngest members of the team, I know them very well because they are my kids. <laughs> okay. And I split my time 50 50 uh, between MIT and Argonne. Argonne is uh, one out of 17 national laboratories in the US. Uh, so it's a fairly you know, large um, system of research laboratories. Argonne was actually the first one, which dates back to the Second World War. Uh, uh, and the Manhattan Project, which you may have heard of, but it was also the first place where the first controlled nuclear react reaction happened uh, back in those days by Enrico Fermi. Uh, uh, 
And now, you know, it's grown to do much more than uh, nuclear uh, energy and physics. So, you know, it hardly works across a wide range of, of areas, including uh, renewable energy. This is, you know, some of them listed here. Uh, it's a fairly large scale facility based outside of Chicago. And compared to university research, national labs, they do a little bit more of some mission oriented research. So the main sponsor, the UE, they have a lot of different programs, including for energy technologies like wind power, solar power, energy storage, electric vehicles, and so on. And they have very aggressive targets for, you know, reaching typically cost you know, based future goals to bring technology costs down to those levels. And you know, playing a fairly important role in this transition from basic fundamental research to applications and industry and industry use. We are a small team working on electricity markets at, at Argon as, as well. Working on things like you can see here, decarbonization, reliability, uh, resilience, you know, uh, including uh, links to climate and weather forecasts and projections, which is becoming increasingly important to consider when you plan and operate uh, the grid. Okay, so I have I guess just a few slides, probably more than I can cover. Uh, so if things get boring, let me know and I'll can move to the next topic. But uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to start off boring. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Uh, by giving you like an update on, on the decarbonization landscape in the US, uh, focusing primarily on the electricity system. I'll talk a little bit about the to do on low and zero carbon markets. Um, past expansion modeling is one type of methods we use frequently to analyze these types of questions. And I have one specific study on transmissions role in uh, reaching low carbon systems. Okay, so, so yeah, I have you know, some statistics that I just recently uh, Googled, basically. Um, as you can see here, um, th this is like the different types of electricity generation in the last 10, 15 years. Renewables is growing fast, as we can say. Natural gas has been growing even faster, actually. And coal has been coming down big time um, in the US. You can see that renewables now provides more electricity than nuclear does, as well as uh, than coal, coal does. If you look on the right hand side, uh, wind has been growing the fastest. But solar is also picking up speed quite quite fast. And to give you, you know, some reference points, the US has currently 21% of electricity generation from renewables. That compares to, you can see this, the numbers for the EU. UK, where I happen to be based, and also Norway, being an outlier, of course, because of all the hydropower. <clears throat> yeah, so more statistics on renewables expansion in terms of capacity. You can see, you know, primarily wind power in the early 2000s, then yellow solar power coming in, and the green is, is the batteries. So batteries are becoming a substantial, you know, investment in the last two, three years. Uh, especially in some states. So I like to uh, have a quick quiz here because uh, I have some numbers about states and investments. So what, what state or what states in the US do you think have most investments in renewable energy? California? Yeah. Texas. Okay, you guys are very good actually. Uh, this is last year's numbers. Is it Texas? No. Twice as much as California. And then you can look at the older states here. Um, you can see batteries coming in big time in California and, and Texas in particular. It's interesting. Uh, I'm based at MIT. Uh, I live close to MIT, usually uh, up in the northeast corner of the US, New England, which is the progressive green part of the nation. If you look at the states here, no, no states from that area are on this list, so where, where, where the action happens. That's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, no, so similar numbers in terms of installed capacity, Texas by far in the lead, 25 gigawatts of so, oh, wind and solar capacity, which compares to how many megawatts we have in Norway of hydropower, 27? something like that. Yeah. Okay. Just to give you a, a, a 
reference point. Um, this is like the fractional renewables, and if you look at in the mid west, Iowa, South Dakota are leading in terms of the percentage to the 60 percent or so. Uh, and interestingly, Iowa is where the presidential season will start in just a month or so with the first primary. <laughs> uh, be back off. <clears throat> yeah. So that's that's a bit interesting. Of course, one reason for this picture is that the best wind conditions are in the mid part of the country here. So that that has given rise to a lot of investments in wind power. Addition. The southeast, where very little has happened, is actually coming now because the solar power is coming up quite big time in the southeast. And one reason why we see increasing investments, of course, is that costs have been coming down uh, across the board for wind power, solar power, and batteries, in particular batteries, you know, it's the fastest and steepest declining costs. Uh, actually, in the last couple of years, costs have gone a little bit up again because of supply chain and supply chain crunch after the pandemic. Uh, yeah, and you can see, you know, again, the increase in numbers, also including electric vehicles, although, of course, the US is way behind uh, Norway in terms of that. Okay, if you want about emissions, <clears throat> this is from uh, a report that just came out. You can see here in total, total emissions, they have been coming down a little bit since 2005 or so. Um, but of course, it has to come down much, much faster to reach uh, uh, targets that the current administration has set for, for decarbonization, which is, as you can see here, half of the 2005 in 2030. They have like an intermediate goal of zero carbon electricity in 2035 and then zero economy in 20. If you look at on the right hand side, you can see for the electric power system side, there is actually good news because the emissions there are reducing quite substantially, about 40% down since 2005, because the substitution of coal to gas as well as more renewables. But the other sectors, you know, it's much more flat. So basically we need to keep going down that electric uh, slope downwards and we have to electrify as much as we can the other sectors as well that seems to be the recipe as it is in many other countries right so so a huge huge challenge um temperatures um, are going up of course as well as in the rest of the world maybe even a little bit faster on average if you look at the regional Numbers. I think some places like Alaska seeing much more significant effects than the continental US. From like a power systems perspective, we are just not only in average temperatures, but like uh, extremes. So if this shows like different um, number of very hot days or extreme precipitation events and so on as a function of different average temperature increases. So like the power grid, uh, if you move from like 15 to 30 or even 45 that when you heat to bathe days a year, that's going to make a huge impact on the, the power system. Okay, so what's happening in terms of policy? Uh, in the US, traditionally not that much necessarily, but actually last year, the current administration was able to pass what's called the Inflation Reduction Act, which you probably have heard of if you work in this space. Uh, no, it's a big number. Uh, and what it does is to the primary incentive on the power system side is, is in terms of tax credits, which is the mechanism that has been used at the federal level in the US for many years. But it has been like traditionally like on and off year to year. Now they have introduced this for like at least 10 years, possibly more. So it provides a very stable uh, Know, incentive landscape to plan around. Uh, and also they have ex extended what types of technologies are, are covered by these production tax credits. One new thing is that hydrogen is being given a very hefty production tax credit as well, uh, at, at three dollars per, per kilogram. So you know th this package is giving a lot of incentives for uh, 
investments in energy and electricity in particular. Uh, uh, yes. Just to clarify, does the wind and solar get both investment and production tax credit, or do they have to choose? They have to choose. Yes. It used to be production tax credit for wind, and I invested tax credit for solar, but now they can both choose what no. makes the best sense in, in both cases. And, and also energy storage can get a tax credit, which wasn't the case in, in, in the past. And they have, you know, also specific manufacturing credits, and they have like requirements on, on domestic content in these technologies, you know, which is like an incentive for manufacturing to happen in the US, which has implications for the rest of the world. Like Norway, right? where some companies are shutting down battery factories and building up in Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, it's a global competitive landscape. Um, okay. So, in terms of impact, you know, it's kind of hard to say exactly what's what's going to, how much of a difference this package will will. Uh, will make that, you know, there are people out there trying to estimate this and they use capacity expansion models and similar tools. And this is like a paper that just came out a couple of weeks, maybe even last week, where they try to project here how much would the emissions uh, drop down as a function of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. And you can compare the yellow and the blue lines and you see that the shift is quite substantial. Uh, this graph on the left. And also look at like historical investments in different power generation technologies in the upper part, and then we project the future mix in the lower part um, of like 11 different models from different organizations. And you see primarily a lot more green and yellow, which is wind and solar. Right? So that's you know, in most of the models they they arrive at the conclusion that you know we're gonna see the most investments in those resources. But there's a variation, as you can see, a little bit uh, in terms of how much and, and what type of technology. But if you compare, like, you know, the, there's the magnitudes here. Uh, we need about three times as much investments per year as has been historically the case uh, in the last 20 years or so. so it's a big, uh, big change that's needed. In terms of, of share of low-carbon electricity, uh, you know, the projections indicate the US may reach something like on the order of 60 to 80, uh, maybe even 90 percent low carbon as a function of, of this package by 2035. Uh, which is you know a substantial improvement, but it's not enough to meet that 2035 zero carbon electricity target. Okay, uh, so those were some statistics. Uh, yeah, feel, fresh, feel free to ask questions along the way, of course. We'll get a little bit more into research. The next segment here. Um, and I find this topic of low carbon markets very interesting, as probably some of you guys do as well. Um, so, a little bit about the US power system. You now, physically speaking, it's split into three different interconnections, if you like, with Texas being on its own, and then like the rest of the Eastern interconnect as well. In terms of markets, there are seven different markets, as you can see here, uh, which cover you know, a large part of the country, but not, not all of it. Uh, and those markets are organized you know, in a similar fashion, but there are also differences when you look at, uh, look at the details. Um, yeah, yes. I know Margaret is not on this, but... Uh... Then for the uncovered part, what's going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should point that out. So that that's where like electricity pro is provided to like traditional uh, uh, utilities that are not really under competition, but they are like um, mon monopoly entities within their service territory. So they are regulated utility space, which was the old way of doing things before markets were introduced in the nineties. So there is no, no market there. No there is very limited markets in those areas. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in the other areas, you have one entity, the ISO, that, that both operates the entire system and clears the market 
day to day hour to hour. Okay, so what we know, what we do is we build models like this one, uh, which is at the heart of running the power system operationally from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. You try to minimize the cost of meeting demand, basically, that's the objective function, uh, which includes variable costs, startup costs. Uh, and if you have to, if you have a shortage, there may be costs for unserved energy as well. And then you have a bunch of system constraints. You have to meet all the loads in each node in the network. You have to, to provide sufficient operating reserves. And you have to operate your transmission grid within its limitations. And you have like constraints on individual units, which deals with how fast you can wrap up and down, maximum and minimum output, and, and so on. So some of the research going on is in the context of more renewables. How do you deal with uncertainty in the system? You know, it could be through this reserve balance, or it could be through other means, like stochastic formulations. Um, how do you represent use resources in the grid, like energy storage, which is now playing a more important role? Um, how do you deal with pricing when it comes to non-convexities, as we call them, like binary decisions uh, in, in the scheduling problem? And uh, yeah, how do you, you know, this is a mathematically very hard problem to solve. So what types of relaxations can you make in order to solve this in reasonable time? Okay, so uh, think about future zero carbon electricity systems. What do they look like? from a market perspective, uh, it's kind of, it makes sense to think about what could be the types of resources in these systems. So that's what we try to think about here and categorize, yeah, categorize them in terms of whether they have a fuel cost uh, or not. So, you know, most of the renewables like um, wind, solar, river, hydro, geothermal, they have no, they have no fuel costs. Um, and also, and then you have some fumes like, or some of the resources like nuclear, hydrogen, uh, and CCS type of technologies, which do have a few costs. Uh, but on top of that, you have to think about whether these costs are marginal or, or not. So, you can also down here, it's easy because wind and solar is basically zero marginal cost. But if you look at batteries or comes to storage hydro, or certain other technologies, although the fuel cost is zero, they have an opportunity cost. That becomes potentially very important in the market theory of, of these systems. Uh, nuclear is basically the fuel cost is basically fixed, so that also has zero partial cost. Whereas those up there in the right hand corner, upper corner, they have, they have more like traditional resources. Uh, so you know, one theory there is that these types of resources, if you have like systems dominated by being solar and storage, then this segment up there will be like the most important type of technologies that will drive the prices in future future systems. Um, and here in Norway and in Scandinavia, it's so much hydropower. We kind of have experience with that uh, by optimizing reserves uh, uh, over time, uh, which has been done historically. But now we're talking about much uh, shorter duration storage, you see, like batteries primarily, right? Uh, which you have to operate in the context of more wind and solar in the power grid. So, you know, you may move from like a traditional supply curve type of thing here. Uh, it did very have to be like coal, gas, and then you get a market theory price for different uh, demand segments to a system where the supply is more like zero, zero marginal cost. And then, but if you account for opportunity costs, you may still get some segments where the supply, the marginal cost of supply is non-zero. And that, you know, there's a question of how much different is this future dynamic going to be compared to the traditional. There are lots of theories and work around this specific topic. Um, we wrote, like last year, we wrote more like a review of the literature, US focused on what are the market design options, the main one being discussed in the literature in the US. And we can categorize that. Uh, one is 
you basically improve how energy is priced in the market, enhanced energy only market, or you focus on capacity markets where you pay on top of energy, you pay for providing capacity to the system. But maybe you not need to think beyond traditional capacity and think about things like flexible capacity as well. There are there's some thinking about long term energy markets uh, as an important incentive for investments, or potentially through power purchasing agreements and other mechanisms or auctions. And also, there are some more perhaps radical solutions out there, uh, yeah, which includes going all the way back to traditional cost based regulation, like the white piece of the map we talked about earlier on. It's very lively discussion around how to best do this. Um, I also I mentioned some work that I've been doing with Magnus actually, uh, which started back when he did this sabbatical at, at MIT. Um, and he wrote, or Magnus did most of the writing, but this working paper with 136. On, uh, equations or something like that, uh, which very few people, I think, <laughs> were able to read. Uh, but, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think maybe the main takeaway from that paper, without going into those equations, uh, is that we found that analytically, that if you have renewables, energy storage, and thermal generators as a mix, uh, in you know the energy only market design, they can happily coexist because we can show that under the least cost expansion plan, or the, the prices that would follow makes all those mixes of technologies break even. Basically, so, so based on that very stylized model, one could argue that an energy only market could still do the job as long as you have certain resources with the marginal cost in the system. Okay, so Magnus went back to Norway, um, and luckily, Guillaume, who was one of the few that actually read this paper, <laughs> and he's a theoretical physicist by training, but he is doing transition planning at Hydro Quebec. Uh, he came along and wanted to expand on this work, so we did another case where we looked at the system which only has renewables and energy storage, and the way we analyzed. All of this is basically through a load duration curve here. Um, yeah, the original load here, and then you subtract the amount of renewables to get the net load duration curve. And then you know, through some rather intricate math, you can derive equilibrium conditions. Um, in my opinion, one of the key results here is that in such a system with only renewables and storage, what we found here doesn't quite hold up yet because the prices at these different segments of the net load duration curve actually of uh, includes one term here which is the capital cost of these technologies and that's not the case here and that's not the case in how current markets are operated so that brings up the question should generators offer fixed costs into the market theory which is not how things work traditionally. Um, that was an interesting finding there. And this continues. So we are now we are in the third season looking at long-term contracts uh, and how that may impact the market equilibrium. So you know, so these are stylized, you know, simple low duration curve type models, um, which kind of offer some some like um, yeah, more stylized insights into these questions. Uh, a little bit more on battery storage technologies. We work on modeling those in more larger scale types of, of, of decision problems. And then, you know, the thing with batteries and storage is that you have to keep track of the state of charge and consider how do you best optimize this asset over time. Uh, if you want to provide oh, energy uh, charge and discharge, as well as additional potential services to the grid. And that typically happens under uncertainty, so it becomes an interesting optimization problem. One special thing about batteries is that they tend to degrade. That's kind of illustrated here with different curves, illustrating how much you have left of your battery capacity. The thing is, 
degradation for batteries tend to be a function of uh, multiple factors, but it includes uh, what type of battery you have, but also how you use the battery. So, you know, um, that is a more tends to be a more important consideration for batteries than other assets in the grid. So, you know, that brings some additional elements into the type of operational planning models we need uh, for the power system. I know some of you guys here work on this, this question as well. And, you know, from the investor's perspective, you need to have an idea about for how long your, your battery will last, basically. Okay, and this is more about connecting the world of power systems with the world of batteries. We're also doing some work on combining experiments in the lab and collaboration with chemical engineering. But they, you know, we provide like typical use profiles of batteries and they run those in the lab and then you get the performance of, of the battery over time for application specific uh, purposes. Is, uh, can you comment on uh... Your experience so far with uh, you know, checking more details uh, about how how well are the linear assumptions and so forth for for battery representation, and then and how important is it to improve the physical representation of the different technologies? Yes, uh, that's a good question. It's, you know, typically we need to use relatively simple assumptions in these types of models. So assuming some kind of linear relationship. Uh, I guess experiments do show that for degradation, there may be a really linear, linear relationship for a while, but then at some point it drops off much faster. There's a cutoff point. Um, there's another more, or there's another question around this, and that is who, whose problem is this? The fact that the battery degrades? Is it your problem as an owner of this battery, or is the problem of is it the problem of the manufacturer of the battery? And if the manufacturer of the battery provides you a warranty, you know you could argue that it's the manufacturer's problem. So maybe you don't need to even consider that in in these problems. Uh, you know, that's a lot more, it depends on the perspective you have, right? Um, but I do think that the, what they're trying to obtain with this type of work is to get better insights into you know, operating areas where batteries do not behave as they expect them to do, basically. Okay. Uh, this is a project at MIT, which, um, is it how do we handle um, risk in electricity markets as we see you know uh, more renewables in the system and uh, the main idea concept it's a collaboration between multiple uh, project partners but the main idea here is that we introduce a new entity a risk risk bureau on top of the you know, market participants, the system or market operator and market monitor, which is already there. So the idea is that this risk bureau uh, provides additional information to all of these entities in the existing system. And that is information about to be forecasts for the next few days, but also historical data. So one idea is to develop like a something like a, a risk score or credit score for individual assets. It can be used as used as an additional piece of information, uh, both from the ISO perspective and from market participants' perspective. Uh, and just briefly on the ISO perspective, one type of model we have been working on is a stochastic bi-level market clearing model. And uh, that's a mouthful to, to develop because it's fairly complicated. But at the high level, the idea is that you feed a probabilistic forecast into a scheduling, stochastic scheduling problem. But instead of solving this as a traditional stochastic problem, uh, you enforce that the, uh, I guess it's actually here, that the, in the lower level, you enforce that this is compatible with a deterministic day ahead market clearing solution. So, kind of the constraint is that this has to be uh, uh, this has to be aligned with current operating practices. So, if you do like a traditional stochastic model, that doesn't work because you don't get like a 
they had clear cut schedule. In this case, we enforced that constraint in the lower level and imposed that onto a stochastic uh, scheduling model. Um, of course, there's much more behind it than that, but what we can show is that we have like a benchmark for this stochastic model, this bi-level model that uh, Dong Wei, the postdoc, developed. Uh, and then like the my myopic is a deterministic model, and they can compare like system costs. This is simulations for a realistically sized system, New York ISO. And Dong Wei developed this relaxation based on McCormick envelopes to, to speed up the computational, make it computationally feasible, basically. And if you look carefully at these bars here, you'll see that the bi-level model is always pretty close to the green stochastic model. Um, whereas the myopic deterministic model sometimes deviates a lot from those uh, those two models. It depends on you know, how much renewables you have in the system, how flexible your system is. But in principle, you're able to demonstrate substantial benefits of using a stochastic approach to the market clearing and scheduling problem. Um, that is still compatible with current day ahead and game time market fluctuations. That's, that's quite exciting, actually. Uh, okay. Let me see here. So, a few words about capacity expansion modeling. I think Magnus talked about this recently in, in his talk here. Uh, he did publish this paper recently. Um, and most of you know basically what capacity expansion modeling is. I will just point out that traditionally, the users of these models were like utilities, electric power companies that use this to as input to their investment planning. These days, in the context of decarbonization, it becomes very relevant for policymakers as well in, when they determine what types of policies to introduce. And we saw examples of that in those projections of the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance. Um, again, you know, similar type of problem formulation, but you have planning decisions built into the model. In the objective function, you want to minimize total costs, which includes investment costs as well. Um, you may, may build in certain policies into this formulation with like um, a carbon tax, a production tax credit, uh, or you may want to put constraints on how much renewables you want in the systems, or you want emissions to be below a, a certain target, right? So, so that uh, the model, you know, finds the optimal portfolio resources for a future year, even those types of constraints, which also still includes unit level type of constraints. Uh, and yeah, you can categorize models depending on what type of details they, they consider, basically. Uh, and here's one example we did at Argon comparing like what to be the impact of a carbon tax versus a clean energy standard uh, and a pure carbon emissions reduction target, which would give you the least cost solution of meeting a you know a or, or meeting a carbon emissions uh, goal basically. So you know you can look at like what's the total system cost, what's the mix of technologies that will follow from uh, different types of policies. So that's just one example of, of uh, more like policy-driven analysis. Um, just the question that do you find that the, there will be differences between the like the optimal policy of uh, uh, carbon emission uh, constraints and the other type of incentives? Yeah, in some cases you use, I mean, I, I don't think one spent too much time on the figure, but you can, yeah, you can show that you know, certain types of policies does lead to inefficient from a pure cost perspective uh, results. Like, so you can show that, like, the production tax credit or the investment tax credit is not the cheapest way to to reach a carbon emissions goal. Uh, you could argue in the uh, U.S. case where carbon taxes are basically off the table at the federal level at least. So you know, second best is sometimes the best you can do. And interestingly, if you look at the uh, clean energy standards and the carbon emission target, if you set the standard to 100%, you get the equivalent result, uh, the same portfolio and the same cost actually, if you go all the way to zero carbon. So at that point, policy may not matter that much any, any longer. 
Um, you can also look at, you know, the relationship between electricity market outcomes and policies. That's what we did in this paper from a few years ago, where we, you know, we imposed different policies to increase the amount of renewables in the system, variable renewables, around 30% at the base case, and then we looked at carbon tax, investment tax credit, production tax credit, and an RPS. And the main thing here is that, you know, if you increase the amount of renewables to through a carbon tax, you would see like an increasing energy price in the electricity market. Uh, but if you use the other more like targeted technology specific incentives, you see the prices uh, basically having a downward slope here. So, you know, that brings you to questions around how are these technologies or all market participants going to re recover their costs if the if the uh, environmental incentives provides this downward pressure on, on prices you know do, do you get like a fair playing field under that type of, of, of policy so this intersection between policies and markets market outcomes i think is very important to uh, to look at, and of course, that new the Inflection Reduction Act did focus on the ITC and the PTC, so it will have certain implications for market prices moving forward. Okay, uh, I'll try to wrap up pretty soon here. Um, just give you an idea about so we were talking about least cost planning models. You know, how do you minimize, or maximize some kind of functions of to constraints from the centralized almighty perspective you know we control, control everything in the system that's not very realistic in reality at least not in the markets we also look at like decision making of individual um, companies and how they may interact between each other in the market uh, to find some kind of equilibrium solution uh, you know, at scale, basically, and there's like a well-established methodology to do this uh, by by formulating each of these problems as a bi-level uh, optimization problem, the right hand side here, and then you run those individual Renko problems until you reach uh, convergence, and at that point you have a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and you know, again, looking at different market designs. You can compare what comes out of the least cost model and the market equilibrium problem. Uh, and basically, the answer is that the results can be very different between those two models. You know. And in principle, the equilibrium model should be more representative of what happens in, in the real world. So uh, the graph on the right, right hand side there shows you the difference in the generation investments under those two approaches. So with the uh, equilibrium model, you got more investments in storage and wind power, much less in PV uh, than you did under the least cost model. So depending on the questions you're analyzing, you know, uh, you need different types of tools, basically, is the, is the uh, I guess, key, key message here. Just uh, uh, regarding yep. that, have you also studied, studied this uh, Cost uh, recovery issue uh, with uh, like uh, capacity expansion models, and uh, what did you find? Yes, we, we do, and it's uh, oftentimes you find that you don't recover your costs. Basically, especially with the least cost type of model, you get once you add also those constraints into your system, you no longer have a cost uh, revenue. You know, companies do not necessarily make sufficient. Uh, revenues to cover their costs. So, so yeah. And that is for all uh, type of generators and storages, or is it particular so, ones so, that uh, suffers most? Depends on the on the on, on the cases. Uh, and this specific thing happens. You know, if you look at the conventional old-fashioned system with again with uh, well-defined marginal costs. This this effect is much less than what you see in like a future system, which is based primarily on, on variable renewables. But the exact answer depends, of course, on the specific case you are you're looking at. Yeah. Let me also mention that we're looking at the impact of climate change. So we have like climate models, thinking climate models on the left hand side. 
and we use statistics machine learning to extract features from the huge amount of data they produce and they will arrive at you know power systems relevant data like demand the solar that can go into um power systems planning exercises and the idea you know is that as we look several years or decades into the future it's not sufficient anymore to look at historical weather as your base your decisions on so it's an attempt to merge findings from very huge complicated climate models to something that we can deal with when we plan our system yeah do you have a, um, like a paper on the last uh, topic you mentioned yeah. climate model uh soon hopefully <laughs> okay and also um here it seems that you use some climate inputs and uh, machine learning techniques to generate some scenarios yeah. Is that correct? And then these scenarios will be put in uh, in some kind of optimization model. Yeah. Yes, actually, well, yeah, basically, yeah. So you know, the climate models mm -hmm. they produce a lot of time series data. Yeah. So something is that you select basically representative ones, or maybe the extreme ones actually to to build robustness into this. Can this type of model can evaluate the damage to the climate, or it's just uh, you can only this climate is, data is only used for scenario generation. Well, the idea, so you know the climate models they have to assume something about future um, amounts of quickly greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and depending on what scenario you look at, you get different types of future weather, right? So, so that's kind of a given assumption in here. So the idea is to produce. Uh, relevant time series data that is reflecting what different climate futures or what, what the different climate models uh, tell you about the future and and then again to at the end of the day to build sufficient robustness into into the the power systems planning model uh, to account for the change in the so, yes i just heard um I can't remember the reference, sorry about that, but uh, there was this claim that these kind of models, machine learning models, uh, are better at forecasting weather in the long horizon than the classical MET kind of models based on physical systems. Uh, have you studied those kind of things? Uh, so what, what type of forecasting horizon are we talking so like, about? Uh, like a half, up to a year. So the, the claim was that these kind of models outperform uh, Classical uh, models based on physical physics, yeah. But I, I don't. Uh, I, what I do have some experience with is like short-term weather forecasting models, which are used to you know forecast wind power, solar power load for the next day. Well, I know that in the very short term, uh, a few hours ahead, uh, statistical-based models tend to be superior. But once you go a certain number of hours ahead, the physics-based uh, models kind of take over because because it's more I guess physics that drive the changes in the web. That's a different setting though. So it's an interesting question. The article I heard is but longer term forecast is now we're able to post post forecast better weather in yeah. the medium and longer term. That's that's yeah. the claim from so. yeah yeah I mean that's interesting. I mean um so the, you know, what we're talking about here, these are all physical, physical models here on the left-hand side, and we use statistics to extract information from those physical models. And I guess the conventional wisdom is that you need physical, some representation of the physics at those time scales. Right? And the, the, uh, the drawback with uh, machine learning is always that it's a black box, so you, you have limited explainability. But you know, there are definitely pros, pros and cons there. Um, let me skip this topic here. I mean, I wrote a paper on transmission expanding, expansion planning and show that it's very important to, to lower the cost of the uh, carbonizing the system. Transmission is hard to build, uh, but there's a lot more interest in this now. And there's an act, a bill in Congress that would impose Transmission expansion limits on different regions in the US. So maybe that is one way of breaking that bottleneck, who knows? But it is a very important uh, for, for renewables. So let but, me go. But yeah. 
because uh, is it right to say that the uh, the US it's much less uh, transmission between different regions uh, than in uh, in Europe as a comparison. My understanding because, is yeah traditionally yeah. that's been the case. Yeah. So the transmission network hasn't been built out as much as in Europe, but I mean, in Europe also you see definitely both legs in some places, right? Even more in the US. Yeah. Both. Yes, and on top of that, you have three different interconnections that hardly have any any links to them, between them. So uh, yes, good work. Okay, so electricity is important. I think the future, the decarbonized future is going to be electric. Um, Largely speaking, uh, so it's you know critical for the energy transition, but we need to invest faster, uh, and we have to learn how to deal with weather-driven resources. Uh, and solutions to this renewables integration challenges include I like to categorize them as hardware. You know, we need the storage, transmission, all sorts of flexibility. But also, you need improved algorithms, you need better markets, and you need energy policies and incentives that. Uh, are somewhat aligned with those markets as well. Um, so, and then the storage is going to play an increasingly important role. So there's a lot, lots of interesting challenges here, depending on your background and interest, you can pick your your, your, your topic basically. So uh, it's a very exciting field to be in, I think. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you.